The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So let's talk about uh, memory today and the fragile power of memory. If memory didn't work, we wouldn't remember anything, we wouldn't learn anything. So we know it has to work reasonably. Uh, but it has a number of fragile aspects we'll talk about where, of course, we forget things. Uh, but on top of that, it turns out there's ways in which our memories get less accurate and distorted, are, are not actual records of our experience, but rather our interpretations or our memory of our memory. And we'll talk about experiments that reveal that. So to a large extent, we'll talk about what do we know from scientific research about why we remember some of our lives and why we forget so many other things that we experience. Uh, and, a, and a version of the, of the way that people sometimes think about it is in what sense is memory like a camera that every experience you have is stored in your mind somewhere? We all have the experience, perhaps, that something will remind you of something you haven't thought about for days, weeks, or years. Right? And you go, oh, well, they must be all stored there. I just need the right cue or the right path to get that memory. Uh, so that's one version of memory. Everything is in us, recorded. Sometimes we can get to it. Sometimes we can't. Another version is the way to think about your memory. It's kind of like a punch bowl. You put in some milk. And then you put in some orange juice and swirl it around. And then you put in some Coca-Cola and swirl it around. And it's not a desirable drink that you have in your bowl. But you can no more get the specific milk or the specific orange juice or the specific Coke because they're all mixed together. And is memory more like that? That as life goes on, things get mixed in, and the raw memory is never recoverable from the mixture of subsequent experiences, thoughts, and feelings. So uh, we'll bring the same perspective a little bit. Bottom-up memory might be you know, really the video camera, if we had it, an actual recording of what we hear, what we see, what we experience out there in the world. Top-down processes are the mental uh, things we have in our minds that let us interpret what's out there. Um, uh, concepts, expectations. Also, it turns out you'll see that subsequent experiences go back and change memories from prior times. And which of these things, the bottom-up original experience or the top-down interpretation, grows over time to constitute your memory? So we can have a very simple model of memory, uh, a flash for a moment, we'll, I'll give you an example of how people test this, of sensory memory, very tiny, moments only. Short-term memory that you can rehearse in some cases. Somebody tells you a number and you can repeat it over and over again. You have that capacity. And then long-term memory, things that last uh, for a long time. You can define these things many different ways. When we talk about the brain organization of human memory, we'll say that short-term memory pro is probably lasts seconds, and everything after that is long-term memory. Now, of course, if you just experience something, you remember it better. If it's a week, a month, a year, five years from now, most likely less better, right? So time passes. But we think almost all of that is in the context of long-term memory capacities of your mind. So here's the kind of experiment. I won't really, we'll, we'll do a couple of exercises at your seat, but this I'm just going to give you a feeling, because you have to, this would require millisecond timing to do correctly. But the way they approached this sensory memory, the flash of memory, the just you know, capturing for a moment what's out there, is something like this. So imagine your job is to report back the letters that you see. Okay. Yeah, you're getting a number of them. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, so that method would be, you just did what's called the whole report method. Tell me everything you saw. Um, they, they did uh, another approach, which is present letters. And then right, at, just, just as it disappeared, they would get a tone, a high, medium, or low tone. And that would tell them which row to report, the top row, the middle row, or the bottom row, depending on the tone they heard just after the flash, immediately after the flash. Does that make sense? OK. It's gone. But the tone is telling you which one to report. And the striking finding on this was this. If they showed you 12 letters like you just saw and said, tell me everything you see, people could give you about four letters back. Maybe you had that experience, about four letters accurately. If they gave you the letters, they flashed them, then you got the tone. For one row only, you got about three letters correct. Now, this is interesting. The letters are gone, but it's kind of like as if the photograph of your memory is fading. But if you put your attention somewhere, you can still pull it back 
but just a little bit of it. So, okay? Because here you get four out of 12, here you get three out of 12, almost the same, because your attention can zoom in on that fading mental image of what you just saw. Um, so this much is sensed, but attention only selects a little bit to be remembered, okay? So that's this very first moment of memory. But uh, you know, one of the more impressive lines of research is the next moment, short-term memory, keeping in mind something in your mind briefly. And one of the most striking aspects of human short-term memory is it's limited in how much it can hold, and across a tremendous range of materials, words, letters, shapes, tones, and so on, you can hold approximately seven plus or minus two chunks of information, limited short-term memory. Um, so uh, now I need somebody who's willing at their chair to do something. You will have to, uh, I'm going to read to you numbers and ask you to repeat them back, but your eyes will need to be closed, and it'll be fairly challenging. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, so, uh, close your eyes. And here we go. Ready? Keep your eyes closed until we're done. Repeat after me. Six, one. Repeat. Say, when I'm done, I'm sorry. Yeah. Ready? Six, one, nine, four. Repeat. Six, one, nine, four. Ready? Ready? Three, seven, eight, five, two. Repeat. Three, seven, eight, five, two. Four. Ready? Ready? Nine six five two eight three. Repeat. Nine six five two eight three. Great. Ready. Four two six nine eight five one. Repeat. Four two six nine eight five one. Very good. Ready. Eight one six three seven two four nine. Repeat. Eight one six seven four two one nine. Okay. Perfect. I'll, I'll open your eyes. Thank you very much. So you did terrific. Uh, you did, uh, you got four right, five right, six right, seven right, eight right, you got it mostly right, you just reversed one or two. Okay? Seven plus or minus two, doesn't matter how smart you are, how advanced you are. Uh, uh, there used to be some confusions about this because they would say kids in different countries have different limits, okay? And they'd say, oh, our country's smarter than your country, okay? <laughs> and people, or our educational system is better than your educational system. It turned out that all of that got equated around the world if you counted up the number of syllables that are in the digits. The real unit of memory here are syllables, okay? So in English, it's, it is mostly, most of the numbers are one syllable. One, two, three, four, five, six are all one syllable. Seven gets two, right? Eight is one syllable, nine is one syllable. In some other languages, the words that go with the digits are two syllables, and the real unit is, so, so countries that have two syllables, they had lower spans because, not because they were dumber or had a worse education system, it's because the real unit is number of syllables, because you're hearing it, it's language. OK, is that right? OK. So around the world, it's just a fundamental capacity of the human mind is that you're limited to this kinds of stuff. So how do we get around that? You know, why are we not always barely able to do anything, OK, uh, with very small amounts of information? So it's just a constraint of our minds. Uh, it's because background prior knowledge, things you know before you have to learn something, has a very powerful effect. It allows you for the information to be retained in memory, but it has a double-edged sword, which is kind of a theme in my today. As much as it helps you remember things, it can fool you into misremembering things. And let me give you a concrete example. So you can, have put, you can put chess displays in front of people who are either beginning chess players, have played for a while, or are masters. And this is, they're not going to play. They're going to look at it. The pieces will be swept to the side and then they have to put all the pieces back out of memory into the same location where they just saw it. They know that's going to happen, right? So it's a memory test. Here's the pieces. Take a look. The examiner sweeps the pieces to the side, and you put them back as well as you can. You see it. It gets swept to the side. And you reproduce it from memory, what you just saw. And here's the performance uh, of uh, master players and beginner players in this case. So people who have played a lot of chess and people who play very little chess. It's better to be high the number of correct pieces. Um, and here's, there's two kinds of displays. In one kind of displays, what we call the normal displays, those are ones that could really have happened in a game. They were kind of reasonable configurations of pieces. The random displays are pieces all over the place in a configuration that you're not likely to see in a real game of chess. Equal number of pieces. And look what happens. The best performance are master players who see a real normal chess configuration. 
Here are the players who are beginners. And look at the worst performances, the chess masters who see a random setup. So what do you guess is happening? Yeah. A lot to memorize games and positions, so they're used to seeing those patterns. And when they see a random configuration, they can't recreate it as they do. Right. So the people who play chess a lot have a lot of configurations in their mind, background knowledge. They use that background knowledge of what a chess array means. Somebody's in trouble. Somebody's winning. You know, something interesting is happening in this corner. That knowledge helps them escape the boundaries of seven plus or minus two, uh, and they do a lot better than the Beginners, for whom it doesn't mean much. It's just a bunch of stuff out there, hard to remember. But what happens here when the pieces are random? The chess masters are making mistakes because they're putting the pieces in the places they ought to be rather than the places they perversely were randomly located. Okay? If you're a chess player, you, you, know, you don't like that random board. right? It doesn't feel right. Uh, and so, but they're trying to be accurate. But now they're misplacing their memory for what they actually saw with their mental model of what ought to be out there. Okay? Now, the players who are not so good, they don't, you don't see much of a difference between these lines. It doesn't make, they don't understand when it's random. They don't understand when it's organized. It's just a bunch of pieces. Is that okay? So the double edge of background knowledge. Background knowledge lets you escape the bounds of limited short-term memory, but at a cost of sometimes substituting in for the actual experience you had. OK, so we'll try this. Organize, and people use the word chunking. There's the way in which you use your background knowledge to get big pieces of information stored that are better than you'd think from short-term memory limits. So here's a quick one. Ready? Oh, I need, I need a volunteer, actually. Not too bad. Wow, tough volunteer day. You're mad at me about the exam. OK, thank you. All right, all right. OK, ready? What were the letters? OK, how about these ones? <laughs> all, right, all, right, all right. You see, it, same letters, it's just that now you see the chunks, and you can map them onto long-term memory more easily. OK? Plus, I showed it longer. OK. Anybody else want to try something like this? Thank you. OK, ready? Here we go. Ready? Oops, so this is showing that. What letters do you see? Ready? OK, now I'm going to let your background knowledge triumph. Ready? <laughs> All right. Same letters, right? But you can use your back. It's the same letters. The others, okay. you don't believe me. All right. uh, uh, same letters. All it is, this, this one, not, your background knowledge is useless. Your knowledge of words, your knowledge of the alphabet, useless. Same information in a sense, same number of letters, same identity of letters, but now your background knowledge is powerful. OK, um, okay I need somebody else, one more volunteer. I mean, so, look, thank you. Right, ready? I'm going to show you a sentence. This is meant to be hard, the first one. Don't worry about it, OK? Here we go. Can you tell me what, what they were? That's pretty good. OK, let me, let me, let, let me show you another equal, equal number of words. Ready? Go. OK, what, what is it? Yeah. You would do better. OK, I know. It's, it's, it's hard to pull these things off. Well, anyway, so 13 words, you know, people would do pretty miserably this, although you did very well, uh, a lot better at this, because again, you can use your background knowledge of what does a sentence mean, what's the organ syntax, all your background knowledge can be applied. Again, the power of background knowledge is immense. I can tell you that if you go work somewhere, or if you're working in a lab now, or if you're working in any place, you know, you might be impressed by people who are older than you and what they know and what they can learn and pick up. It's background knowledge, background knowledge, background knowledge. Okay. Uh, it lets you quickly understand an idea because you can interpret it from prior ideas you know. Quickly read a paper because you slot it into prior things you know. Background knowledge is incredibly powerful to let you discover the signal and get a lot of the specific information in any kind of information out there. So, um, oh, Tyler, I left with you this time, sorry. So we're going to do a, a quick memory test. You will do it at your own seat. You're, it's voluntary, uh, uh, but I will ask you to sh sh share some a little, a little bit of information. But this is for everybody now, not for one person to be put on the spot. Um, so what I'm going to do is read you a list of words, uh, wait till the end, and when I, say, when I say recall, write down the words from your memory, OK? So I'll wait for a moment to forget to 
pencil or pen or something. Okay. I see a few people still getting stuff. Okay. All right. Ready? Here comes the word. So just listen. Don't write. That would be too easy, right? I'll say recall and then write them down. Here we go. Mailbox, sardine, shotgun, peacock, credit, detail, flicker, airline, spinach, clarinet, recall. Okay. Here are the answers. Okay. Um, as you look at this list, put your hand up if you got all 10. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So now think about this for a moment. Uh, we said 7 plus or minus 2. When the words are presented uh, in a random, unorganized list like this, you're pretty much back to short-term memory limits in many senses. Not completely, but in many ways. So if you were to tell a person on the street, I mean, I have to say two things about you guys, which is certainly true and complimentary, OK? You're at your, most of you, uh, if you're somewhere between 18 and 25, you're at your peak memory capacity for the rest of your life. You will never do better. <laughs> you will never do better for rote learning than you are right now. There's a ton of research that shows that. You will never do better for rote learning than about 18 to 25, okay? After that, it's downhill, okay? Uh, you get other benefits, you know, salaries go up a little bit. You get authority, that's a nice one. Um, uh, <laughs> but rote memory, you're, you're at the top. Not only are you at the top, but you know, you are an incredibly selected, academically achieving group, right? You're MIT undergraduates, right? You're incredibly selected to be the top of the top in many senses for learning between 18 to 25, as far as MIT can possibly figure this out, right? Okay? You are our hope for the future, right? <laughs> if you guys can't fix global warming, you know, we're in trouble, all right? So, so you can't get 10 words? Come on. <laughs> we have big problems to solve, right? It's a capacity of the human mind that we just can't do about more than this, right? It's just amazing how limited rote memory is without other things. But there's a little bit more that we can tell. How many of you got mailbox and sardine? Fair number of hands, okay. How many of you got spinach and clarinet, the last two words, fair number of hands. How many of you got credit and detail? Way fewer hands, and that's what happens on a well-controlled experiment. So this is correct, high is correct. This is uh, what order the word was in. The first word you heard, say the fifth, this, was, this experiment is 15 words. You can see that People are, you know, here's their performance. Two things are noteworthy. People do best for the first couple of words, and sometimes they do best for the last couple of words. So here are three delays. These delays are zero seconds what we did. You get the list, you immediately write them down or recall them verbally. That's zero, you know, immediate. Or I wait 10 seconds and then say, now recall. Or I wait a half minute and say, now recall. Now for memory for the first two items, what's called a primacy effect, it doesn't matter. In all three conditions, those are the best to remember words on average for most of the experiment. Okay? Um, and people think that's a signature of long-term memory. You can get those one or two words, and then you start to get overwhelmed okay? <laughs> in long-term memory. Here, you only get the boost for the last couple of words if there's zero second delay. If there's 10 seconds or 30 seconds delay, no boost. So people interpret this recency effect, superior memory for the last couple of words, as a signature of short-term memory that lasts only seconds. And so within a simple experiment, you can see long-term memory influences, short-term memory influences, and short-term is very short-term. It's just seconds. Um, now, Ebbinghaus is one of the founders of experimental studies of memory, and he was heroic. I mean, he, uh, he would just train himself. He used nonsense syllables because he wanted to get rid of a lot of background stuff, rote memory. And he would learn thousands of these 
and then test himself and score himself honestly. Okay? He, did the, he did the bulk of the work on himself, and he discovered something that's pretty simple, but that uh, uh, has had a huge effect. So how well do you do since you learned something, all in long-term memory? If you're tested immediately, 100% of it's a small list, and you studied a lot. 20 minutes later, an hour later, nine hours later, you can see the steep forgetting up until about 10 hours, and then it sort of hangs in there. A forgetting curve of long-term memory that we, you know, immediately afterwards were pretty good. Then there's a lot of forgetting in 20 minutes and for a day, and then things hang in there. This, 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 this shaped uh, asymptotic um, curve of forgetting. Okay, now, here's another mission for you. You need a pencil or just your fingers will work fine either way. Um, you're going to see a list of words. Some will be in uppercase, some will be uh, in lowercase. Capital letters, uppercase, okay. Your job, as you see them, from top to bottom, is tap your left hand for each word that's in a capital letter, and your right hand for each word that's a lowercase letter. Is that okay? So if the first word's capital, you tap left. If the second word is lowercase, you tap right. And you just tap, tap, tap until you get to the bottom, and then it will go. You ready? You ready to help me out? Here we go. Thank you very much. Here we go. Excellent. All right. What were the words? <laughs> okay. You might be impressed that even though they were right in front of you and even though you were looking whether they were upper and lower case, so you really saw them, uh, if, you don't think, if you don't bring the relevant background knowledge to remembering it, which is the meaning of words most of the time, uh, our memory is pretty hideous. Okay? All right. Let's try another one. Now, the trick is gone a little bit, so we're going to do another, you know, I'm, it's a little bit of a setup, but I can tell you it's scientifically true. Okay. So now it's the same idea. You're going to see words, but think about, you're going to read the word. If it's a living thing, like a dog, tap the left hand. If it's a non-living thing, like a chair, the right hand. Ready? You did awesome. Thanks. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Does it feel like you would remember the words better? Okay. Does it feel like you would? What were, okay. So here, here's what we did. The first list is you thought about the appearance of the word in memory. That's called shallow encoding, just if it's upper or lower case, and typically that leads to pretty poor memory. If you think about the meaning of the word, we think that optimizes memory. People call it deep encoding, and it leads to better memory. And in a well-controlled experiment, now here we had a certain order, and you knew there was a trick. But if you have a well-controlled experiment, here's what you find. If you just think about the appearance of the word, uh, here's how well you do, pretty low, for, if you see the word once or twice. And if we look over here at the meaning of the word, you can see one thought about the meaning of the word is better than two presentations thinking about the appearance. And two thoughts about the meaning of the word and your memory is really excellent. Yeah, question. So if you're forced to think about the, get confused by the uppercase versus the lowercase and the living versus the was it confusing to do one than the other? It was a little bit, right? Yeah. Is that supposed to make you remember it better? Do you have to think that hard? Uh, no. Usually, well, the, if it, to the extent it draws you to think of the question is, is the confusion of doing the two different tasks help you out? So roughly speaking, the answer is to the extent it draws your attention more to the word, yes. To the extent you're sitting there going, OK, was it uppercase or was it living? And this is, this is weirding me out. It's going to hurt you because your mind is filled with those thoughts, not looking at what's in front of you. Is that OK? Yeah. So, but you, we can do, you know, in these demonstrations, it's, they're, a li they're a little uh, kludgy. <laughs> um, here's a fun one. The effect of context. So they, this is how they did the experiment. You could do it different ways, but this is a fun one. They actually went in, in, in the United Kingdom to the shoreline, and they had people put on those old-style driving, diving helmets, you know, the old big helmets, and you go under the water with the big hose in front of you to your air source. And they had them learn word lists, like you were looking at word lists, on the land or underwater. So underwater, they're hearing the word, OK. Uh, and then they were tested for those on the land or in the water. And here's the, the core message was, you do better remembering information if you're tested in the same situation in which you learned it. So what we see here is if you, uh, here's the words learned un underwater, you're better if you're tested underwater instead of going on the land. If you learn the word on the land, you're better off if you're tested on the land than if you go underwater. The context in which you learn something helps you, right? Being studying in the water, underwater and tested underwater, you do better than studying underwater and going on land or vice versa. Being in the same room, same time of day, uh, all those things help you a little bit 
to bring a memory back because those are parts of the memory is the context in which you experience it. Another approach that people have taken, this is about organization. They'll present a set of words like this, ask people to try to remember them. Pretty big list, you know. But if you take the same words and do that, same words people remember a lot better because there's an organization that helps you, your, your background knowledge of what is a career, what is housework, what is a food, all, all contribute to helping your memory for these items be better. Um, so let's think about forgetting. Some, we know something from last year, we forgot it. There's at least two ideas that people have said, what's the core reason we forget things? One of them is like passive. Well, I haven't used it for a while. You know, uh, you know, it's just not available anymore because time has passed, not been used, not available. That's passive forgetting. The other way to think about why we forget is not that it's a passive loss of knowledge, but that experiences you have after that moment when you learn something will go back and write over and muddy and confuse your memory for the original event. It's active interference of subsequent experience. It's not passive withering. Other stuff is getting in your head that's writing over and modifying the original memory, and the original memory is never there again. Um, and one, and people have talked about it in two different directions that you can think about this. One of them is what they call proactive interference, where things from before mess up your learning on something, or retroactive interference, you already have the memory, and now new things mess you up and write over the memory. So memory is threatened by what came before the experience or what happens after the experience in the way that it interferes uh, with accuracy of memory. So here's a fun experiment. It's just two subjects, but there's a lot of other studies that looked at this. This is the original demonstration. Um, where people had to remember syllables, and they, te they taught them the syllables just before they went to sleep or as they woke up. And then in each case, they were tested, for example, uh, some number of hours later, let's say eight hours later. And their idea in the study, and there's one wrinkle I'll, I'll mention now that we know things, their idea was, look, when you go to sleep, there's no retroactive interference because there's, you're not learning anything else, you're not experiencing, you're not talking, you're not reading. So when you wake up in the morning, nothing has messed up your memory from when you just went to sleep. Does that make sense? If you study in the morning, now you go and you have your day, you go to classes, you talk to people, you read things, all those new experiences can go back and mess up the memory you acquire to start with. So in both cases, you get the memory to start with, but in one case, you're sleeping for eight hours, it's not messed up. In the other case, you're out in the world, lots of new things are happening, they're retroactively messing up the memory. And I'll answer, let me just do, let me just do the thing. Uh, and you can see the people who did, who slept after they learned when they woke up did a lot better than the people who walked around during the day. And that's thought to be one of, then a huge line of research saying that one of the reasons that memories become unavailable to us is not simply passive withering, but active other mental experiences that block, write over, and change the original memory. Question, yeah? Well, so if you study in the night and then go to sleep, does just having those memories hanging around in your brain strengthen them? Because you're going to wake up and do stuff. And yeah, so now there's a second thing we now know. The question is, is there something good about going to sleep after studying? And the answer is, uh, there's a lot of evidence now uh, in animals and, and increasingly in humans, that sleep is a period that can so fixes memories uh, from the prior day. And if you, if you don't get the right kind of sleep or something like that, those memories from the prior day don't, don't seem to get as well fixed into long-term memory. So this is mixing those two issues. These people have two advantages now, we think. One advantage they have is they're not having new experiences during the night that are messing up the memory they got, okay? And they're having this consolidation period during sleep. Uh, people have long studied, like, what's the use of sleep, okay, <laughs> besides making you not sleepy? And uh, 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 one of the most fascinating things is, and there's just more and more evidence for this, is that it's a period where, because our brain is kind of quiet in many ways, it seems to work a lot on fixing memories from that day into a better long-term unit. Is that okay? So there's people at two advantages by our current understanding. So that's retroactive interference. Let me give you an example of proactive interference. Um, and here's how they study it. We won't try it, but let me give you an example. They, they, they uh, would have you hear three words, like banana, peach, and apple. They're all related. Then they have you count aloud from 138 backward by sevens for a few moments, OK? And they say, what were the words? And you give what you can. Then they give you plum, apricot, and lime, count backwards by sevens, melon, lemon, grape. You can see all these are from the same category. And then they switch the category. 
So we said typically background knowledge helps, but here's the way it can get weirdly not helpful. So here's the performance of you know, healthy young people doing this. So this is percent correct, good is high. The first list, they're really good. Okay, occasionally they forget one of the three words. But look what's happening as they go along for the second list and the third list. They're getting worse and worse. That's proactive interference. The experience in the first list is messing you up to learn the new information in the second list. And most of the errors people make are substitutions. They go plum, apricot, apple. Okay? <laughs> By the third list, they're going melon, lime, apple. Okay, because, you see what's happening? Because they're related, because they're related, now you're getting confused. A sec if, I just, if I heard the word uh, grape recently, was that in the first group? I'm not reporting that one right now. It was in the one before that or the one I'm supposed to report right now? The relations among them mess you up because it's hard to tell when you heard them and they're all related. And just to convince you that it's true, because you might say, well, maybe you're just getting tired, you know, like list and list and counting. Then they give you a new list and look what happens. If it's fruits, still fruits, you're still stuck. But if it's another list like vegetables, flowers and meats or professions, very different, your memory zooms right back up because all the interference you had here about fruits is no longer relevant for learning a set of professions. And it's kind of graded, right? We think of flowers as more related to fruits, <laughs> kind of, uh, and professions as very unrelated, you know, doctor, lawyer, programmer, right? The more unrelated it is, the more your memory goes right back to where it was because the proactive interference is no longer happening. Another um, thing that researchers have focused on is, you know, as we read things, or, and, and what, what do we uh, focus on? So here's an example where they read people's sentences, read, they actually saw sentences or read them, and then they tested them and either for the meaning or for the style of the sentence. Now, usually when we read stuff, we're focused on the meaning, not the style, right? I mean, style, we might notice it, but usually we just, what, what am I reading, what's the point? Um, now, if they were warned that they would be tested, if they weren't unwarned, they read the sentence, then you're tested, much better for meaning than for style because we automatically go for meaning. That's what we go for when we read, by and large. When we think about poetry or something, that might be different, but reading typical tests, what's the meaning? We strip away almost the, the style. We want to get to the content. But people are flexible, and they're terrible if they're asked about the style, the specific organization of the sentence, the word-by-word -word organization. But of course, if they focus on it, they can do a lot better. So this is just saying we naturally go for gist and meaning, and we try to throw away a lot of the specific particulars, like the way the sentence was organized, the style of the writing. Um, okay. So now I'd like to do a demonstration uh, that will work better for some than others, but here we go, right? Um, uh, uh, so uh, here we go. I'm going to read you a list of words, and then I'm going to um, ask you for a couple different words and ask you if they were on the list, OK? Here we go, ready? Door, glass, pane, shade, ledge, sill, house, open, curtain, frame, view, breeze, sash, screen, Sutter. Okay, was the word glass on the list? Okay. Was the word potato on the list? No. Was the word shade on the list? Yes. Was the word uh, car on the list? No. Was the word window on the list? No. Okay, how many people said window? Come on, put your hands up. Ian. Come on. I heard a lot of window. I heard a lot of yes. All right, you're not helping me out here. Okay. Uh, smart undergraduates like you, at the peak of your memory, will about half the time say yes to window. You saw this demonstration before, or you heard it before. Uh, the way they compose these lists is uh, they ask students to say, what's the first word you think of that goes with door, the second word? And the first word that goes with door, the most common one they'll put over here. We'll, okay, that's the trick word, the lure word. And then these are other words that people think kind of goes with the word door. So if you hear this list, and then either you're tested for, did you hear the word window or see the word window? It doesn't matter whether you see it or hear it. About half the time, undergraduates will say, uh, yes, I heard it or saw it because they're getting the gist of the list. This is all about door and window stuff, right? So when the word window appears, they have a false or illusory memory. The rate of false or illusory memories goes up with age as well. When you're, uh, for every decade that will pass, you'll add a few more of those, okay? Uh, the, uh, but uh, even, even undergraduates, typically about half the time, they'll falsely recall they heard the word window. Again, the idea is, here's this double-edged sword. Oh, you go, it's about words that go with doors and windows. So when you get, that's the gist, that's the main idea. When you get the word of window, you falsely believe that you saw it or heard it. So that's the way that people try in the laboratory to, um, 
to, for, to create false memories that are experimentally testable. We'll talk about real life ones just in a moment. So we said, you know, all these things make it feel like memory is more the punch bowl metaphor than the camera, right? Because it's all switched together, the proactive stuff, the interpretation, the retroactive changes that are created in memory uh, are all altering the memory uh, based on the interpretation or based on subsequent experience. Um, so let me stop for one moment uh, to tell you, OK, so memory is shaky. Wouldn't it be cool to have truly photographic memory? I mean, that would be awesome as a student, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't be bad in life. There's only been one well-described case of a person who seems to have truly photographic memory. You hear various stories. Uh, most of the people who you know, are things like memory performers or there's memory Olympics and things like that, they train the heck out of themselves to use different methods that can enhance your memory. And they can do amazing things, but it's all hard work, okay? It's all hard work as far as we understand it. But here's a guy who was different, studied by Luria, a, a psychologist in Russia, about 100 years ago. So this is a guy who was a reporter at a newspaper, and he would go out uh, and come back and you know, type up the report of what he had seen at some event for the newspaper. And the editor noticed that this guy never took notes. Okay? He came back and he just started typing. And the editor said, you got to take notes, because you won't know exactly what happened, who said what exactly. You know, you'll make mistakes. The guy said, no, I'm always perfect. The editor said, OK. <laughs> you know, I'm, we're going to teach you a lesson about this to, just to show you. And he said, OK, he got some material. And he said, everybody come around. He's going to embarrass the guy, right? I'm going to read you something. You tell me every word I said. He read him some, you know, some gibberish, and the guy repeated every word perfectly. This guy truly had photographic memory. And kind of interestingly, when they said, wow, you have photographic memory, he didn't go, yes, I'm awesome. I'm, I'm a superhero, right? He said, doesn't everybody? All right? he, didn't, he, was not, he was not aware that most of us don't remember every single thing that we study easily and for the rest of our lives. So uh, he would be presented you know, rows of digits like these, study them for three minutes, and he could recall them um, uh, uh, days, weeks, and months later, perfectly. You could, you know, okay? Truly, this is almost the only case we have well described and well analyzed, uh, so it's really rare. Um, uh, he, he would say when he would have to think back of a particular list, oh, tell me the one from you know, last year or tell me the one from two years ago, he would have to think where he was and reinstate you know, so in his mind's eye, he would see the room or hear the voice of the person reading it to him. Um, uh, but, you know, fif even 15 years later, perfect memory for a list like this. Wouldn't you like to have that, you know, <laughs> right now? I wouldn't mind it either, okay? Um, uh, he also was synesthetic. That is, when he heard things in one modality, it triggered perception-like experiences in another modality. He could change his resting pulse uh, from 70 to 100. Uh, he could uh, change his temperature by two degrees by force of will. He's an unusual person, okay? <laughs> I mean, I, you know, we would, we, were actually, I, we would love to discover another person like this on the place of the planet. We have not seen another one well, well documented. Probably there is, but, you know, they're sitting somewhere in some village remembering everything perfectly, going, I thought you all remembered everything perfectly. <laughs> uh, uh, so you could think, wow, that's awesome, nice superpower to have. Uh, um, is it, but uh, he was not a happy person. This is kind of an interesting question. Because he, he complained that when somebody spoke to him like a family member, what would happen was he would be flooded by a word with some memory for some list or some event last week, last month, or 10 years ago. Okay? His family member said, they, like, you're not listening to me. Yeah, because every word or thing you know, triggered back, brought back a flood of memory. Um, he got so miserable things in his environment would trigger perfect floods of memory into his mind. And this is truly like a novel, uh, that he would, at one point, in order to get rid of memories, and this did, did not work, he wrote them down on a piece of paper and threw them into a fire, thinking somehow that would work. OK, it didn't work. <laughs> so this is one of these you know, uh, Twilight Zone, O. Henry, depending on you know, kinds of stories, right? uh, where you think it's awesome to have photographic-like memory, but in fact, it seems to have uh, blocked, in many ways, his development as a person. He became, once he realized he was so, uh, had such a rare memory, he became a professional memory performer, uh, and then all kinds of jobs, and finally retreated into countryside, kind of unhappy, treating people with herbs uh, with his wife and son. Okay. So he did not have a happy, awesome life. Now, I don't know if in, a dis in this world he would do better, because you could get on TV shows and become a celebrity or something, if you could do this, right? Uh, but um, uh, uh, so, so what, what's the problem with photographic-like memory, do you think? Why is it that we kind of wish we had it at certain moments, but what's the drawback? 
Well, the drawback seems to be, imagine if you had in your head a photograph of everything, you would have so much stuff <laughs> that you wouldn't be analyzing it for the basic point of what it's about. So we just said the risk of analyzing things for their basic point, their basic gist, is that uh, we want to get the bottom message and we give up a lot of the particulars. It's not like a photograph. You know, it's like a very small abstract or a, d a note about a photograph that's in your mind. But that's a very powerful way to approach the world because then all your background knowledge is instantly available to help you interpret what's going on because you're using lots of connections and very few particulars, okay? Too many particulars are as burdensome as probably having too many generalities. Let me talk a minute about flashbulb memories. So this is a kind of funny thing. We might have, you might have the experience uh, in your own life of very salient moments, big moments in your life with your family, other things you're doing in your life where you say, I'll never forget this moment because just everything is so vivid for me, what people call flashbulb in the old days with fl or still flashbulb. Uh, so, you know, we can never know how accurate your flashbulb memory is, right? You go, I'll never forget when I got into MIT the moment because I was wearing the, my lucky socks and it was sunny outside. And you might be right or you might be wrong, okay? So there's a slightly gruesome um, research enterprise uh, which takes public events that are very emotional for people. So this, some of them will be very historical for you, some are in your lifetime. John F. Kennedy's assassination, uh, the challenger blowing up uh, as a high school teacher was you know, going up to be the first high school teacher to do that. The O.J. Simpson verdict. You guys are too, how, do you, were you even alive for the O.J.? No, <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, I can tell you that got an unbelievable amount of interest because I, I'm from Buffalo. That's where O.J. Simpson played football, so I had a particular interest. But, uh, you know, it was like everything you wanted in a, in a, in a TV show. I mean, some, tragically, two people died because O.J. Simpson's a super famous football player. That huge debates about whether he had murdered uh, his wife and, a, and, and another person in a house. And there was an exact moment when they said, get everybody, get on your TVs. You know, here comes the verdict, OK? Um, or the 9-11 attack. Uh, 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 so here's this funny research business. What, what people do is they go, and as soon as these horrible things happen, they ask people to write down, where were you? What were you doing? How did you learn about it? What were your feelings? What were the feelings in people around you? And what did you do in the next hour, OK? They can't, you can't be prepared for this other than wait for something horrible Everybody says, I'll never forget where I was when 9-11 happened, or things like that. People feel that way, and they certainly remember that day more in some sense than a typical quiet day, okay? But here's what they do if they test them on their own answers, you know, so that you gave the information just a little bit after, presumably it's roughly correct. If you're tested a year later, yes, you remember that day better than other days, that's, but it's full of errors. It's full of errors, and people are way overconfident they say, I know where I was and you, and a year later, and, and you know, I know I was with my friend. And you say, but what, a year ago, you wrote down you were by yourself. You go, oops. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure I was wearing you know, my raincoat. And you go, oops, you wrote down you, know, you were wearing a sweater. You go, oops, OK. So y your memory is way higher, but it's full of inaccuracies. Even though people are sure it's not, they're sure that's not inaccurate. Okay? And that's, that's the way. Uh, so the next horrible public event that happens, There'll be a bunch of memory researchers running around. And my TLs were saying, where were you? What were you doing? What were you feeling? Because we need that to be able to verify whether your memory for emotionally intense experience is accurate or not and how long it lasts. Um, OK. So a couple experiments and then a video. Um, so here's eyewitness testimony. There's nothing more dramatic in court, right? Uh, on the TV shows in real life, if you have to be around these things, where the person says, you know, who was the person who murdered your neighbor? And you go, that's the woman, that's the man, right? And the jury's looking, oh, okay, right? Okay, so how accurate is eyewitness testimony? I mean, of course it has to be somewhat accurate. We're not living in a crazy world where people are randomly imagining things, right? But how accurate is it really? Because, uh, so here's a kind of an experiment they did. Uh, this is work from Elizabeth Loftus, who's a leader in this area. She would have people just see slides this is before computers, basically, uh, where a sports car would come to an intersection, would turn, and would hit a pedestrian in the slides. So it's not the drama of really seeing it. You know, it's a stage thing. And there would be either a yield sign or a stop sign uh, just before the car turns that you would clearly see. And let's pretend you were in a condition where you saw the yield sign. Then afterwards, they would say, did another ca car pass the red Datsun while it was stopped at the yield sign? That's consistent, the word yield. Or did another car pass the Datsun while it was stopped at the stop sign? See, you slipped in the word stopped, right? 
uh, or you're neutral, you don't say anything. And now you say, which slide did you see? Okay? You show them the actual slide with a stop sign or a yield sign. You saw the yield line, but here's what happens. If you saw the yield sign and you, and you uh, uh, are shown this yield sign, you do pretty well, consistent. But look what happens if you s saw the yield sign, you got the question, did you see a stop sign? And now you're tested, which, what did you actually see? You're pretty much wrong. You're pretty much saying, I saw a stop sign. That's retroactive interference. You saw the yield sign, you were asked about a stop sign, and now you believe you saw a stop sign. That's why it's so important how police or other people interrogate witnesses, right? Because if they saw, if they slip in certain words, people will have a hard time going back to their original memory. They'll have a memory that's a mixture of the original experience and the questions asked about that experience. Um, so people say, oh, that's just a laboratory experiment. In real life, that wouldn't happen. So they did this experiment. Uh, uh, Jim, a graduate student, reminded his younger brother, Chris, that they lost Chris in a mall when Chris was five, uh, and, an, and an older, tallish man brought him back. So that would be a pretty traumatic thing for a five-year-old to be lost in a mall and have an old man take you back, right? OK? All right. Certainly for the parents who are going, where's the kid? Where's the kid? Okay. So two days later, Chris says, the, the younger kid, um, yeah, not, yeah, I was with you guys for a second, and then I went over to look at the toy store, the KB toy, and then we got lost, and I was looking around, and I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. You know, and then I thought I was never going to see my family again. I was really scared, you know. And this old man, I think he was wearing a blue flannel, came up to me. He was kind of old. He was kind of bald. He had a ring of hair. Chris, <laughs> Chris was never lost. He was never, this Jim, the graduate student, <laughs> mean to his younger brother, but for good science reasons, told him this slight story. He didn't give him any of these details. He just said, remember when you were five years old, you got lost in the mall, <laughs> and the old tall man brought you back? But what's happening is, you know, our memories of when we were kids are pretty vague. You know, Chris is sort of mixing in some real things that happened and the story, and he's fabricating, you know, for no, he's not trying to get away with anything. He's just creating this false memory. So, um, and they said, oh, no, we want even more life, lifelike than that. So here's the experiment they did. They had 120 students see an ad uh, for Bugs Bunny at Disneyland to evaluate the ad. So you're, you're brought into a room and say, we want to, Mark a test whether this is a good ad uh, uh, for Disneyland. And then they said, you know, and when, uh, and, and these are, the, and then, and all, had, all these people had been to Disneyland some years ago as kids in real life, okay? Then they said, you know, by the way, we're thinking about Bugs Bunny. When you were there, did you meet him? Did you shake his hand? Uh, uh, now, what's the big trick about Bugs Bunny at Disneyland? I saw some smiles right away. He's, Bugs Bunny is one of the few cartoon characters that many kids know that's not a Disney character, okay? And by law, cannot be found at Disneyland or Disney World, right? <laughs> but one out of three college students remembered seeing Bugs Bunny at Disney World or Disneyland when they were a kid after they had just seen some promotional material showing Bugs Bunny, you know, shaking hands, right? They sort of forgot, you know, because they had been there, they don't remember stuff. Okay, Bugs Bunny, sure, okay, <laughs> all right, all right. So again, how potent is this way that we mix up new information with the original experience. So we can't tell apart the original memory from the mixed up new relevant information. I mean, this would not have worked, of course, if they show you King Kong, right? You go, there's no way I saw King Kong, right? All right. It has to be slightly credible, a yield stop. You know, but, it, it, but, it just, but it's a pretty big difference in some cases. So here's one example in real life. Uh, this is a real case in a dark October night. A woman hitchhiker picks up on Pacific Highway south of Seattle. A hitchhiker turns into an isolated rope. Uh, the man brutally rapes her and leaves her by the side of the road. 24 hours later, she looks in an array of photos, and she picks out a man who is convicted because she says, that's the man who brutally raped me. A few months later, another man is arrested for a series of rapes. She sees his picture in the newspaper, and she realizes, oops, sadly, this is the man who attacked and raped me. Okay. He's released from jail uh, because uh, he's, by then he's lost his money, his job, his fiance, his reputation. He spends four years pursuing a lawsuit. He dies 11 days prior to the trial. Ten months later, his estate gets $2.8 million because the police weren't very careful how they did the photo lineup. It turns out, if you look at the photo lineup, his was the slightly outlier picture of the six pictures. Okay, So the woman went for that guy. So when she's accusing in court, she's not trying to lie. What's she mixing up? her memory for the photo array versus her memory for the original event. 
those two have gotten blended in the punch bowl of her memory. Does that make sense? Perfectly with good intention. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, there's 80,000 trials you estimated that rely on eyewitness testimony, and many, many of those are mistaken. It's just human nature to mistake them, especially because trials are not boom one minute later. There are lots of discussion, lots of uh, you know, interviews with policemen or prosecutors or lawyers. Lots of things happen from the original crime moment until that moment in court. Every discussion and thought and feeling you have from the original experience blends in with the original experience, and it can be hard to pull those apart. Um, here's another sort of weird example. Uh, a woman at home in Australia, she's brutally raped in her home. She identifies Donald Thompson. Now you'll see why this is a bit ironic uh, and weird story. A renowned Australian psychologist who studies eyewitness memory problems, okay? It turns out he was on television at the moment uh, that she was being raped. And obviously, she's in a very disturbed, difficult moment. And so she conflates the face on the TV with the face of the actual horrible perpetrator, okay? Uh, so he has a good alibi. He's on TV somewhere, okay? But you know, in a perfectly good way. I mean, she's trying to be correct. These things get jumbled together. Um, so you're going to see in one minute a film of uh, Susan Nason. So here, this is an amazing story. Eight-year-old girl, uh, well, sorry, you'll see the film of Eileen Franklin, but she, Susan Nason was an eight-year-old girl who was missing and found murdered in October 31, 1969. 20, uh, see, 20 years later, Eileen Franklin, you'll see her, remembers that her, remembers that her father uh, murdered Susan Nason testifies against him and he's found guilty and he goes to jail. He's been subsequently released because she says, I was with him when he murdered my little friend. But she doesn't remember it continuously. She remembers it because a therapist has had her think about her past and all of a sudden what she feels like was a repressed memory comes back. So we're gonna show Tyler Figure a movie about this topic. It's, a, it's your next paper topic. What's the status of memory? So this, let's separate two things because it's really important. Cases where um, women or men, more often women, uh, remember being uh, uh, abused, sexually abused, you know, and they remember it all the way through. They may not like to think about it, but they remember it all the way through. That's, com that's not what we're talking about now. What we're talking about are the, the rarer cases where a man or a woman says, I haven't thought about this. I feel like I've repressed this for 20 or 30 or 40 years. Uh, and now, more often than not, because of, I'm, I'm working with maybe a psychologist or a clinical psychologist to help me with problems I have, more, you know, uh, I recover my repressed memory. And it's a brutal thing, because you can imagine, on the one end, you have, a, say, a young woman accusing her father or uncle or the father, let's say, of doing something that we think is a, you know, terrible, which is sexually abusing her, and the biggest, you know, Failure of trust you can have in a father, uh, the biggest, you know, huge violation. So he's horrible if she's right, but if her memory is inaccurate, what's more horrible than an innocent man being accused by his own daughter of, of uh, sexually abusing her because her memory is incorrect? So we'll, we'll, we'll show you two films briefly, and then we'll, yeah. So the father went to jail. Um, so here's, here's the lawyers who were defending the father wanted to tell the jurors the following thing, which is, you know, in every account you read is accurate, uh, that, when, that everything that she described about the death of that girl, Susan Nason, every detail she described was in the newspaper accounts of the time. And that no detail that she provided uh, was you know, verifiable and different than newspapers had reported at the time. Does that, do you, so, so, you know, one of the things that people like to do, investigators, is have the person know something that wasn't publicly released. And everything that she spoke about in regards to the little girl's murder, Susan Nason's, was publicly available information that had been on television or in newspapers. And the, the judge originally ruled that the jurors could not be told that. Uh, and then later on, uh, they retried the father, the jurors were told that, and the father was let go from jail. Um, so there was this huge pendulum swing, because originally as these repressed memory cases were brought up, people said, well, why would the woman lie about such a horrible thing? It's so horrible, of course she must be telling the truth, and of course the father must be lying to protect himself. 
But now, especially in the context of uh, repressed memories, again, very different than continuing memories, the ones that are recovered after decades, there's a suspicion that some of them might be inaccurate. Uh, and that some, some psychologists working with some patients might be having patients think about possible sources of their difficulty, and these memories get falsely constructed. And the hard part, and the part that you'll write your paper about, is knowing which is which, right? Because it's heart-rending, right? You know, it's heart-rending to have a woman who was abused be not believed. Uh, it's heart-rending for a father who was not an abuser to be accused of being an abuser. And it's incredibly hard to have direct evidence about who's telling the truth and who's not um, in these kinds of cases that are so far from when the crime occurred uh, and, you know, or might have occurred, and, you know, where there's a such a long period of non-discussion about it because it's been repressed for decades. So you look at that, it's a, a big test. It takes you into a course, it takes you into clinical uh, complexities of people.